What I'm going to say today is that I think doing data analysis is actually super hard. And it's hard for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, I've been doing this for about 25 years. Uh, and actually, I was doing data analysis for about 10 years before that. My first paid jobs that weren't mowing lawns and washing dishes were uh, programming for uh, academic researchers and uh, social science research houses here in, in New York in the early and mid-1980s. And what I've learned through that process is that you know, we get really excited. We're doing some data analysis. We've got a co cool chunk of data. We start writing code. We get the data read in, which is always so much more of a pain in the ass than we think it's going to be. We figure out that there's a bunch of values in the data. Hey, Mark. Um, we see a bunch of values in the data. We're like, what the hell is that? We spend some time cleaning the data. We got it to a place. We get the analysis. Cool. We've got the analysis. We've got the, you know, we've got the, we calculate the table or the graph. We get it to our boss. And we're like, whoo, done. Check. On to the next thing. We put that away. Three or four weeks later, the guy's like, hey, you know that graph you gave me? Um, how'd you get this point? How, how did that happen? And you're like, oh, yeah, no problem. Let me just, you go back to your code and you're like, uh, well, I named all the variables x. Um, oh, it looks like I overwrote the input file, so I don't have that anymore. Uh, and where was this other intermediate file that's referred to by these three pieces? All right, that's not cool. Okay, so one of the ways that we could subtitle this talk is I'm going to tell you where to put your stuff. Okay, and, and really at some fundamental level, this is what we're doing here. You know, I've heard uh, one kind of great programmer that I like to listen to kind of speaks oracularly from the mountaintop, talks about the practice of programming is like, you know, the book of Genesis. We're just naming things, right? It's all about just like putting names on things that organize and rationalize the entire process. And what I'm going to talk about are some principles in statistical workflow that get us to a place where we can figure out what we did later. It's all about proving to someone, usually yourself, that what you did was right. And so what we're doing is thinking about how do we organize projects and write code in ways that we're going to know what we did when we look back on it from some time in the future. This is about being nice to your future self. Okay? But it's also about being nice to your colleagues. Because it may be that you're not the only one working on this project, that you have to share work with others. And so it's a way, how do you organize work so that you can collaborate with others? It's actually, the, I'm skipping, that's actually the next slide, why we do this. But let's talk about what our principles are. I'm going to call this principled data processing. And the principles referred to in principal data processing are transparency, auditability, reproducibility, and scalability. So transparent means that we can review every piece of the work along the way. So how do we expose what we're doing to ourselves again, such that we can review what we've done along the way? Hey, Brian, good to see you. Second, how can we test what we've done? And this is subtly different than review. We're such that we can audit what we've done for ourselves. How can we make sure that what we've done is actually correct. And what we've done may mean what our colleague has done, and our colleague has said, hey, could you have a look at this because I'm not actually sure if I got it done correctly. Well, how do you know? How, what are you looking for? How do you look at it? Well, if you design the project properly, those questions are much easier to answer than if you, if you design the project in an opaque way. So reproducibility means that anyone else who comes at this problem will get the same answer. This turns out, of course, to be a giant fail in almost every fi field of science, um, as people who've been paying any attention recently, from forensic analysis in criminal justice work to the entire field of psychology to fMRI MRI studies. Everything seems to be failing reproducibility right now. Um, look, we're just writing code and pushing data from one end to the other. If we can't reproduce it, well, dude, like seriously? Like, why not? Like, that shouldn't be that hard. It is, though. And scalability. And so I want to turn to this notion of scalability because the kinds of rules I'm going to suggest today, <coughs> if, if all you need to do is get one graph and, and you're just going to jam it out the door and nobody's ever going to look at it or question you, okay, you, you don't need any of this folder all. You, you, you're done. Go get a nice brunch. Have a couple of mimosas. You don't need to sit here. But if you have a problem that sounds like more than two, maybe you should stay. If you have more than two input files, and you might get more input files in the future, and you need to process all of those input files in a consistent, coherent way, well, 
maybe you should stay. If you have more than two updates to the input files, if you're going to get data updated sequentially and you want to continue that process, if you're going to have more than two analysts who all have to collaborate, maybe you should have some common rules about what you're doing so that you can read each other's code and your, co and your work integrates well together. If you're going to have more, more than two results that you have to publish, more than two studies, more than two papers, more than two graphs, more than two sequential pieces, well, maybe the piece that you do second should be processed in the same way as the piece you did first. Okay? Maybe you should maintain some consistency over the life of your project. Um, there are different kinds of analyses. Maybe there's different kinds of languages. I can reproduce these more than two rules indefinitely. right? But at the point where you have more than two, you want to start thinking about how the structure is going to work. And so let's start talking about what the design tactics are that we're going to use to build these structures. First of all, think about things in terms of a pipeline. Okay? Almost everything I'm doing is going to be informed by some of the meta lessons of Unix. And one of those meta lessons is that one of the ways we build things is we build little tiny tools and we glue them together and push stuff through and it just goes like that. And literally, it's called piping in Unix. Okay? <coughs> it's flowing from here to there. Okay? And you can map that. And I'm literally going to show you linkage maps of tasks as we go through this in which stuff moves down the pipeline. You can manage project flow with symbolic links. You're right. Right. If you're using Windows, I, don't, I can't help you. So let's just stop now. I'm going to assume that you're doing your work professionally, which means you're using Unix. Okay? And if you're not, I can't help you. I'm sorry. I, we're just done here. Because if you want to use interactive tools in Windows, uh, then all, I mean, what could happen, right? You could calculate that austerity measures are successful at creating economic growth. <laughs> Right, and what could go wrong? OK, I'll just leave that alone. Um, so I'm going to assume you're using Unix, which means we can use symbolic links. And I'm going to talk a lot about why symbolic links are so incredibly valuable for this process. And make files. And I'll talk a little bit about make files. It's, again, it's about reducing complexity. All of this problem is about reducing complexity and creating a standard set of, of reasonable tools that you can repeat through your work. Everything's in code. If it's not in code, how are you going to remember it? I sometimes have trouble remembering my own middle name. Um, so yeah, I do remember it right now. But, um, but the problem is that you can't depend on yourself to remember something that has to happen in a project. Everything that has to happen in a project has to be written in code, not in documentation. Okay? Because code evolves faster than documentation. <coughs> Documentation is useful in some very narrow circumstances that I'll talk about. But when we're talking about a data analysis project, documentation is the kind of thing that managers who don't code impose on us. It is not something that is actually going to be useful. So I'm going to argue against documentation. Indeed, the project structure needs to be fully adequate to document what it is you're doing. And if it's not, then you don't ever know if the documentation is consistent with what actually is happening in the code. So our argument is if you build the project structure as documentation, if the project executes, the documentation is correct. <laughs> and if it doesn't execute, the, project, the documentation is incorrect. But you have this very hard, clear line about whether or not it works. Um, simpler is better, but don't make a fetish of it. This is kind of one of the things that comes out of the, world, uh, the Python world, which is, informs a lot of my uh, my, my programming aesthetics. Explicit is better than implicit, but again, don't make a fetish of it. Exceptions are bad, but sometimes you have to make them. Again, don't, don't make a fetish of it. It's, it's all about trying to get in these directions. Um, look, use Unix. I, I'm just going to stop. There's no other way. And, and, then, and also, use the terminal. Um, try to get away from your graphical interfaces. And this is, again, another part of getting toward self-documentation and getting toward structures that link together. And I'm going to give you a series of examples of this. But the advantages of getting comfortable in the terminal are that all of a sudden, your project doesn't have to live anywhere. In fact, your project lives everywhere. Your project lives on a version control mechanism, whether that's GitHub or uh, you know, some other version control mechanism you create. Uh, your project can drop down into any machine, whether it's a, you know, an instance that you rented on, on an Amazon cloud, or it's uh, you know, a, a colleague's machine, or your 
you know, you're, because you are so benighted by your local uh, IT staff that you have to use Windows, you secretly dual boot into a Linux box that you hide from them <laughs> and to get your actual work done, I'm looking at you. Um, <clears throat> okay, then you can, you know, using Unix gives you this opportunity. It doesn't matter what kind of Unix, I'm not, um, but, you know, learn bash, learn SSH, learn screen, these things, these tools, these tools will make your life better and more powerful. Um, and then here I'm going to start getting into some details about what I mean by tying tasks together. If you design your analysis to run from scripts such that the scripts accept um, external, all the, all the file references, all the path references, everything comes internally to them as long form Unix arguments, then you can start building very standardized structures for making each task. That sounds like a big, big mouthful, and I'm gonna unpack that extensively through this talk. But it's a really big deal to not embed file names in your scripts. That hides what you're doing. What our job is to make clear what we're doing, okay? So this is an instance of a larger principle which is called separating data from logic. We do our logic here, and data is the input to that logic. And obviously, like a CSV file is, is, a, is a chunk of data that we're gonna feed to something. But let me suggest to you also that, that file references and dependencies among pieces of a task are also a form of data that you wanna separate from the logic of your code. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. And then the other thing is avoid cleverness. Okay, cleverness, um, and believe me, almost every time you use a regular expression, you've just fallen into the cleverness trap. Um, Sorry to say, believe me, that has very, very, very bad implications at this particular time in our political history, but um, <coughs> I'll try not to say it again today. But cleverness is the enemy of long-term smarts. Um, and and one, of the, one of the forms of cleverness that I myself often fall into is using string arithmetic to generate file names dynamically when I need to generate a bunch of outputs. And then you're like, where the hell did those outputs come from? And it's buried in some complicated loop where you're generating names. And how do I find that? A year after I wrote that code? It's impossible to figure out how these things, it becomes very, very difficult to tie things back together. So at minimum, you can signal that by passing stub indicators through as parameters. I'll give an example of that later. So now I'm gonna complain about documentation. Documentation and code is almost never complete, never on point, never up to date. Anyone who doubts me, you're just not writing enough code, right? I mean, seriously, you write code and then how do you know that that documentation is correct, right? You go back and fix a bug, did you fix the docs? No, you didn't, because you were in a hurry, because you had something you had to do. So why do we even bother with documentation and code? Oh, because you know, when I was a sophomore in college, the professor took away points on my code if I didn't write docs. Like, look, this is not a good reason to do this. We need to let go of this. There, are very, there was very little we learned from the Agile programming movement, but one of the things we did learn was that documentation never works. And so what we have to do is think about, it's not that the goal of documentation was wrong. The goal of documentation, make it clear what you're doing, is incredibly important. That's an important goal. How do we satisfy that goal without falling into the traps that the implementation of writing little chunks of text mixed in with the code caught us into. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that with this notion of self-documentation with standard structures and standard, meta standard metadata. The other thing, I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about version control because one of the forms of documentation that's emerging, I think, really importantly now, especially with, the, with, with Git's fork and merge process, is that we end up with an enormous amount of version control documentation that's generated as the process in the process of writing version control uh, commit messages. And what I, what I would like us to really think about is, when do you read version control log files? How many of you guys use git log, right? Yeah, my hand is up. Um, so if you don't use git log, what's the point of git commit minus a minus m? I'm gonna write something here. What was, what was ever the point of I'm gonna write something here if we don't use the log messages, right? If we don't ever go back and use those messages to teach us something, why did we write them in the first place? Well, first of all, we should be writing them in the first place, but, but what we're doing is writing the, documenting the process of the code. And there's a lot of debate right now among people who use um, version control of different flavors. I'm gonna keep saying version control rather than Git because I don't wanna tie myself to Git. I'm not in love with Git, um, but it is the best thing we have right now. So um, 
we learn a lot, I think we can learn a lot by teaching, by teaching ourselves in the future, hey, here's where I was at this point. And think about the stream of version control messages as a way of reminding yourself how you got to where you are. Document the process where you are. I fixed this bug. I learned this thing. Oh my gosh, there's this other thing that needs to be done that isn't done that I just figured out that I've, I've written into this version, into this change set. Okay. I really feel like this is altogether too many words. I've been talking for 15 minutes and we haven't looked at any code. It's starting to make me crazy. I hope it's making you crazy too. One slide more. <laughs> it's the last one. Okay. So let's start doing the engineering thing. Okay. And what I call the engineering thing is this problem is too big. I can't figure out any of it. Is there any tiny little piece I can figure out? Can we come up with a single fixed piece in this world? And then once you do that, you can fix another piece. And then you can start reaching out and fixing pieces until maybe you can get a handle on this previously unmanageable set of complexities and problems. For us and my colleagues uh, in the Human Rights Analysis Group, that fixed piece is called a task. Okay? And a task, which we sometimes know as a quantum of workflow, it's this, this piece, this indivisible piece of workflow. And a task has this pipeline nature that I referred to earlier. It's got some inputs. We're going to do something to those inputs. We're going to write some outputs. Okay? And we literally say we have a directory called input. <laughs> That's where the inputs go. We have a directory called source, which in Unix is spelled SRC. And we have a directory called output, where we're going to write all our outputs. Now, input is read only. Thou shalt not write to output, to input. Source is the executable pieces. That's how we're going to read things in input and do stuff. And we will write them to output. And by organizing every single task in our work, and in our work in Syria, we have, for example, over 100 tasks just in the individual, make, in the individual data set processing steps. By organizing our, data, our, our work in tasks, Every time I drop into a project, even if I wrote it, if my colleagues wrote it, if I wrote it two years ago, I can drop in and I can say, this task is going to have, first of all, an informative name. Clean, for example, is a task. Assign IDs is a useful name. It's going to read the files that are in the input directory. It's the only thing it's going to do is documented by code in the source directory. Everything that happens in that task is in code in the source directory and every result from that task is in the output directory. So if I want to know what happens in this task, I don't have to figure out anything except those pieces are always there. And every single one of our tasks in all of our 30 projects, I mean, sorry, the, the hundreds of projects in 30 countries that we work in around the world um, are organized in this way. Input, source, and output. Now there are occasionally a few other directories in there, but there's always those three. Okay. Um, and then these tasks get organized at a higher level. OK, whew, finally, some actual code. This isn't even actually code. It's just a listing from tree. You know, If you guys ever use the tree utility, tree utility is a terrific utility in Unix that'll just give you a nice tree view of what's going on. And this is the individual branch of our Guatemala work from long ago. And individual means these are data sets, individual data sets that came from, as we say it, there, out outside the project. Okay? So the Truth Commission, the CEH, has a series of tasks. Import, clean, and export. And then there's share, and uh, I can I'll talk about that in just a second. But import, obviously enough, that's where the data actually comes in. When your partner sends you a file, then your logic is, OK, this came from the CEH, and I'm going to import this file. And so I put it in import, input. That's where that file goes. Okay? So there's a file in input which is actually literally a file. That's an important distinction, because that's pretty much the only place we have actual files and input. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. And then I'm going to do some stuff to it with source. Okay? Maybe I'm going to transform it from whatever broken binary format they sent it to me in. And by broken binary format, I primarily mean Excel. Um, I'm going to get it out of Excel into something that we can actually use in the world of actual analysis. Because if you're doing analysis in Excel, I'm pretty sure you missed your mimosa date. You need to go. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to get it out of Excel. We're going to we're going to probably transform it into CSV, which is a horrible 
horrible, horrible format that nobody's managed to better yet. Um, I, okay, let, we can argue about Feather if we want, but I don't know of any other cross-platform binary formats that um, don't have some kind of really weird, uh, weird particularity. I know we're working with HDF5 now, but still, <coughs> it's really, it's, this is a hard problem. We don't have this problem solved yet, in my opinion. Feather is probably our best option, but it doesn't really work yet. So in any case, we're going to read the data from input with the source directory and write it to output. And then we're going to the clean directory, okay? Because after we've just got it out of Excel, we didn't do anything to it. We just got it out of Excel. That's all we did in the import task. We're going to pass it to the clean task. Remember, we're going to do little tiny things. The smallest thing we can possibly do. Otherwise, we get really, really overwhelmed and we end up on a ball on the floor crying. And we can't have that. That is not productive. I mean, occasionally it's necessary, but nonetheless, it is not productive. So stay off the ball in the floor, on the floor crying. Just do a little thing. Like, all I can do today is get it out of Excel. It's horrible. You're like, okay, you got it out of Excel. Okay, oh, that's better. And then you feel better, right? And you pet the dog for a walk, make a cup of tea, and you're like, okay, well, at least it's not in Excel. <laughs> that's how data analysis sounds to me. I don't know about, I don't know about you guys. So then you, can, you read it into clean. So in clean input, what we're going to have is what? The output from import, okay? So this is how tasks start to tie together. You imported the data, then you cleaned it, and then you exported it. So if I say to, if I drop into this project, I did this in 2011, and I drop back into this, whatever, however many years it is now, I'm not very good at math. Um, I drop back into this and I'm like, well, where do I get the data for CEH? It's always an export. It's in CEH export output. That's where I find it. I don't have to ask myself this question. The structure tells me this. I don't have to look in a readme file. I don't have to go try to find an email that I sent to somebody 100 million zillion years ago or however long ago 2011 was. And I don't, none of, it's in that place every single time in every one of these branches for every one of these individual trees. Yes, please, you have a question. How did you get the tasks in the order you want them? Because it's not alphabetical, so how does it come up in that? I, I'm pretty sure I uh, used a text editor. Okay. 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 Um, <laughs> Any further questions? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is some fancy shit here, man. I may have used Emacs, because I'm old. <laughs> Does anyone in here use Emacs? Please, someone. Oh, <laughs> Come on. It's, it's so cool. It's like, these are my grandpa's parentheses. Anyway, um, that was a lisp joke. All right. <laughs> We're going to talk now about the notion of symbolic links. I want to move into this idea that now that we have a task, in order to accomplish something useful, we can't just do one tiny little task, right? That definitely got us off our little crying puddle on the floor, but it doesn't get us to an answer. And we still need to get to an answer because my boss, Dr. Megan Price, is going to be emailing me ferociously like, I haven't done it! Okay, those of you who know Megan knows she doesn't even have that tone of voice in her entire register. She'd be like, hey, don't mean to pressure, but are you done yet? <laughs> well, anyway, and the answer is not, no, maybe not yet, but so I, have to, I need a few more tasks, right? I need to tie the tasks together. And the way you tie the tasks together in a way that's transparent, that you're going to remember when you come back five years later and look at this thing, is with structure, not with documentation. Structure that is itself documentation. So the task names are useful, import clean, export. That's useful. And those are standard. Pretty much import and export are in every one of our branches across all of our work. I'm going to show you some more examples from Guatemala. I'm going to show you some examples from, from Syria, from Colombia. And they're all going to have an import and an export. One at the beginning, one's at the end of this sequence of tasks. And then, please, just put down the mouse. Just, just put down the mouse. I, 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 have a, I have feelings about mice. Let's talk about what a symlink is. How many people in here have used a symlink? Do you know what it is? Okay, not so, not so many, a few, a few. So a symlink is, <coughs> okay, we have a hard disk. This is a hard disk, okay? And on a hard disk, there's, uh, by, in all different file systems, depending on what operating system you're using, there's some mechanism by which we delimit some piece of that disk as the place where data lives. Okay, this is this data, this is this file. And it becomes a file, that region of the disk, or in fact that linked set of regions, which may be spread across the disk, becomes a file when the operating system says, can I read the file? And it has a little software table that says, okay, uh, the file is, 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 is here. And the file has a logical location, its path within the, within the file system, within the directory structure. Um, 
and it has a name, uh, and then it has this map across the disk of where it lives. A symbolic link is another kind of reference in that table. So instead of being a reference to that set of regions across the disk where the actual data lives, it's a reference to the original reference. Okay? And the utility of that, of having a symbolic link to that original reference, is that application layer software, like say, all of our data analysis code, doesn't know the difference between a symlink and the original file reference. As far as the application layer code is concerned, referring to a symlink is the file. But the file system itself knows the difference. And the reason that's relevant is that we can use that linkage logic as our documentation. Whoa, do you guys get chills? Come on now, come on now. That's really, really cool. Look at this. Here I am in the clean directory. Remember we just looked at that? And we wanted to know what's in the input part of the clean directory. And when I say, hey, what's in the input part of the clean directory, what I get are references to import output, just where they should be. But the operating system, the file system tells me this. I didn't write documentation. Instead, the file system itself is telling me the clean task is downstream from the import task. We did import, and then we did clean. And clean is consuming the output from its upstream task. And we know that because the symlink tells us so. Who's confused? Don't be shy. No one's confused. This is totally clear to everybody. I completely think someone's lying. OK. Because I know this is a hard idea. What this looks like is a file name, right? And at some level, it is a file name. At one logical level, it is a file name. In my code, in the code that's going to use this, which is in the source directory, I'm going to have something called standardize and clean. It's an R file in this case. That's going to read these input files. And what it's going to do is get the name of the file in input. But you see, input says, oh, yeah, sure, here's the file. But the file isn't really the file. The file is actually the file that's pointed to up in the, import, in the import task. So again, why is this valuable? It's valuable for a couple of reasons. First of all, if I reran import and this file changed, I didn't have to remember to copy it or anything like that. This reference just automatically changed. So this reference is automatically updated. When this gets updated, this gets updated, which means this file here will run correctly. That's one of its advantages. So the pieces don't get out of sync. They can't get out of sync. They're all tied together. That's the first advantage. The second advantage is this notion of self-documentation, that the structure of the project tells us that this task is inheriting from the previous task. It's inheriting the inputs from the previous task. So they're tied together in a sequence. There's more advantages, okay? which is that we can write code that tells us what the workflow looks like. So this is an automated audit of a project from Colombia where I'm processing the uh, data from the Policia Nacional, and I write a little piece of code that generates this GraphViz um, dependency diagram that says, you know, export inherits from standardized, which inherits from clean, which inherits from filter, which inherits from import. Okay? It just goes right down the pipeline like that. And all I had to do to write this code was go look for all the symlinks. And the symlinks tell us which task is tied to which task. So if I want to say, what's the execution order? I don't have to ask that question. Okay? When, you start, when you start having a lot of tasks, one of the first things that can go horribly wrong is that you do them out of order. And then something doesn't get updated, and then it's not right. Well, you don't have that problem. The symlinks make that all work for you. Indeed, you can use another tool called make and assure that the execution happens correctly, because make will traverse this recursively following the symlinks up and recalculate each piece. Yeah? Do you know does a task ever import from two different tasks? <laughs> that's a real one. Okay, that's a really hard problem. Okay, and so that's, that's what it really looks like in a, you know, I gave you a really, really, really simple one. Yeah, not always so simple. 
So sometimes it's not simple. Sometimes it's a really, really complicated dependency tree. And when you have a really, really complicated dependency tree, now it's paying off. Okay? Now we could go back to the super simple one. We could be like, really? Like, you needed all this complicated machinery? Like, I could have figured that out. Sure you could. I, know, I have no doubt that you could. No, you couldn't. Okay. So, like, some things are doable and some things are not doable. This, when you have a dependency structure that looks like this, maybe you know how to do it while you're working on it, but not, you don't know a year later. And when your colleague comes into this project, how's she supposed to know? Okay. Well, the way she knows is that she can do an automated audit and it all comes out for her like this. And she's like, you know what? What I care about is export. So what happens here? Okay. I need the data from export. Oh, I just need the data. Well, I don't even need to go into this because I know how the task definitions work. I just go to export and get the data. No problem. I'm done. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I actually realized that we had a bug in our clustering step. Uh-oh. Okay. What depends on clustering? And you can follow this out. You have a way to deal with it. And you can always just look at the input directories, right? So you always have this level at which you can look at the input directories and, and read the sim links and know exactly what's upstream. You don't have to do the audited test. I'm just saying there's different ways of viewing the same problem here. And in this case, I'm viewing the problem from the level of the operating system, the file system more, more correctly. Um, here, I've written a little script that just traverses the operating system, you know, scrapes out the, the links and then maps them into GraphViz, which, you know, GraphViz is a pretty nifty tool. I think it's older than I am, um, but, you know, nonetheless, it still runs, which is pretty remarkable. Um, that anything my age runs. Yes? Simlinks are, can you do like folder to folder or are you doing each file explicitly? Now, uh, this is a question uh, on which uh, gray haired neckbeards fight death batches. Okay. <laughs> um, it is a violation of the POSIX standard to allow uh, directory level simlinks, but OS 10 allows it. You can get uh, uninterpretable relationships if you allow uh, folder to folder symlinks. So I recommend doing, I mean, and we can walk down that path if you want, but then you can get situations where you can't resolve the, the set of links. Um, you can do that as well with file level, but it's a much lower probability event uh, doing it with file level stuff. I recommend just doing it with files. Our goal here is to make clear the, um, oops, go this way. Our goal here is to make, make simple What's going on? So if you're like, oh, well, actually, I have like 50 files in that other directory that are all dependencies for this downstream, for this downstream task. OK, again, remember simplicity, but don't make a fetish of it. In that case, OK, maybe you want to have a, a directory level symlink. But be careful, because that can be very confusing. It'll also be really confusing in your make file, which is the next thing that's coming up. Are you writing your make files by hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is not autoconf if you're thinking that. I'm writing the make files by hand, and I'm going to show you one in just a second. Yeah, they're really simple. These are not insanely complicated GNU-style make files. These are really simple make files where we're making something with three or four dependencies, and those dependencies are fixed, and they are not contingent on the local machine. In fact, part of the reason we're doing that, we're writing a make file, is to make clear that no matter whose machine it's running on, these are the dependencies, and this is the output. So no autoconf here. Okay. If you didn't understand that digression, don't worry, because um, I was saying no. <laughs> okay. So here's what this task looks like conceptually when I like teach people, hey, we're going to do record linkage, and here are the steps in the record linkage. Each one of those ovals is actually a, a, a directory, a task, and we render that in this really, really complicated tree. It is a really complicated tree, but if you just sort of think about it, look, here's import. Hey, no surprise, all these individual exports fed into it because what record linkage does is it takes data from, in this case, one, two, three, four, five inputs, five different data projects, the Colombian National Police, the Forensic uh, and Scientific Medicine Unit of the Colombian government, all the NGOs in Colombia, those are my inputs, and then they all feed into this import step I concatenate them and standardize them and then feed them downstream to all these other tasks. And so that's how our record linkage logic works. But I, I put it up here much more as a way of thinking about, hey, this is the kind of advantage we get by using this structure is that it, this is not, I didn't write this, this just fell out. It fell out of organizing the project properly. And one more 
simple little example. But Sorry, let's. What does TS mean? <coughs> training set. So there's a training data uh, pipeline that's in parallel to the to the the, the unlabeled data pipeline. So yeah, that's. I mean, I'd be happy to talk about record language for a little bit of a different talk. Okay. So let's go into some more workflow ideas. And now that we have a notion of I want to just kind of review where we've, what the tools that we've got to build this workflow ideas. The tools that we've got are, we've got a task, okay? We've disaggregated our work into these tasks. Each one has this standard directory unit, directory structure. Um, we're tying the tasks together with symlinks, okay? So the tasks are all linked together in, in, in these sequences. Now I'm going to talk about how does a task, how do we actually build a task? And inside the task, I'm going to start arguing for this, the logic of a make file. And why is that? Well, do you remember how we had an execution order problem? We have a sequence of tasks, and we don't know which one comes first. Well, if inside a task you have more than one script, how do you execute them, right? And what are the command line parameters that we pass to each script? Because the results of those executions are going to be very, very sensitive to those command line parameters, right? I mean, that's really, really important. That's a key part of what you're trying to encode in your documentation, is what did you do? And if you forgot the minus T, Maybe you got a different result. That would be bad because we're trying to, again, be replicable. So the way you do that is you don't have to remember command lines. The only command that I ever give is make space minus f space source forward slash make file. That's the only thing I ever do is I just make. And, I, and actually, that's an alias, mm. Um, and, I, and that's all. That's the only command line, or, uh, command line execution that I ever give for any of my hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tasks across my all my universal projects. I have one command line because all the command line complexity is buried in the make file. And it's, and it's not just buried there, it's documented there, it's memorialized there. So again, let's not mix logic and data. File names and constants never go in code. And constants too. Constants are as problematic as anything else. What was the day that the Syrian armed conflict started? What was that day? Oh, it was March 15th, 2011. Okay, cool. So we're just going to put 2011-03-15 in all our code, right? Sweet, no problem. Every time we need to filter everything, we're just going to bury that constant in hundreds of files. Cool. Two weeks pass. Dude, it started on the 11th, <laughs> not the 15th. Now what, right? And furthermore, even if we didn't have to change it, when I come through the code, I'm like, why are we excluding all the records before March 15th? Why are we doing that? OK, the reason you don't just embed constants is you give them names. Conflict, begin. OK, now we have a name. Now I know why I'm excluding records, because they are prior to the conflict's beginning. OK, but where do you do that mapping of keys and values? Yet another markup language, which in Unix tradition is called YAML. <laughs> Um, I love YAML. YAML is a really, really easy language. I'm going to give you a little bit of examples. And so don't repeat yourself. Don't repeat yourself in the definitions of constants. Don't repeat yourself in the definitions of code. Um, but don't make a fetish of it. This is sometimes in, the, um, in, in, in software engineering, it's called orthogonality or a single point of truth. And that should be always think about how am I defining a constant? How am I defining a particular operation? Um, Am I going to define that in multiple languages? And this is increasingly problematic as we work a lot of data science people. We work half our time in Python and half our time in R. Um, and God forbid, sometimes in Java. I'm sorry for you if that happens. Um, it can happen. And then for some of us. <sighs> in .NET. <laughs> but that's not really data science. That's not anywhere. You're just uh, you're a micro surf. OK. Um, version control is not optional, but it's not easy. Look, the problem is that no version control tools are very good at giant output files that change. Some of my files, and I'm sure some of yours, are multiple gigabytes. And every time you recalculate something, they change. And version control hates that. Version control is made for lots of tiny little files, right? Git was written by Linus to handle the files inside the, the Linux kernel. And all of them are like four kilobytes. They're like tiny little crumbs of files. There's just tens of thousands of them. So the logic is different, but we can make it work. There is now git LFS. It doesn't work all that great. Um, you can maybe use uh, Subversion, which I know is definitely Grandpa's version control system. But there are, it, it works a lot better for, for data analysis than git does. Um, there are some issues. I, I, we have some solutions. We've written a kind of parallel system using rsync. 
It's not a super great solution, but you just, we have to figure out stuff. You've got to use version control. It's not optional. So you have to figure out one of these somewhat broken methods to do it. So let's talk more about make files. Um, I'm going to try to wrap up my talking part in the next 20 minutes so we have some time for Q&A. Um, and I am getting more or less toward the end. Um, <coughs> this is a make file. <coughs> this is a make file from, uh, from my Columbia work. And you know, um, we just sort of say, OK, these are the things I'm going to produce. I'm going to produce two outputs. One's going to be called magic numbers, our data, which is an R data file. And you're like, dude, didn't you just say don't use proprietary or single? OK, uh, I'm going to make an excuse. I also said don't make a fetish of it. There are occasionally exceptions that are valuable, and this is one of them. And I'm going to talk about that in the section after this. But so we're going to create some R data file. And what it looks like we're doing here is creating a PDF. So we're doing data analysis. But the result of our analysis in this case is a PDF file. And in fact, this is the PDF file that were the estimates of total homicides that I gave to the UN's Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Colombia. So this is a result that is actually a report. Wait a minute, what? A report is the result of computation? Totally. Okay, and so what I'm going to show you here is how we do that, how we actually produce a report that's the result itself of computation. So the first thing is just let's look at this stanza. And which one am I going to look at here? I'm going to be looking at, yeah, I'm going to be looking at this one. So this is a, this is a stanza. And it begins with a target. This is the thing we're going to produce. Okay, we're going to produce a file called output slash magic numbers dot R data. And it has three dependencies. So these are the things, these are the inputs that are required to produce this. Now, this is not formally an input. This is actually a, an R script that's going to do the computation. But these are the two data files. One's another R data file, and another is a YAML file that are used to make, these, to make the calculations necessary for whatever has to go into R data. We're in the make level. I don't know what's in, make, in magic numbers. I don't know what that is. But if I want to know how magic numbers gets produced, this is how it gets produced. This is the command line R script vanilla. I'm passing it one argument, which just says don't use any of the site-specific um, configuration files that may be in place. There may be environment variables. There may be other user-defined specifics. Ignore all of that. Execute the first dependency. Make, guys, make was created in the 70s. Okay, So just kind of go with it. It's crufty and ancient and super creaky, and nobody's built anything better. Get your mind around that. Nobody has built anything better yet than make for defining the structure of dependencies required to, cal to do a calculation. Okay? And that calculation is usually compiling a big C program. That's what make generally its, its sort of natural state is. We're using it here for data analysis because these, these two inputs, this YAML file and this R data file, are what we need to create this other R data file. Those are the series of things we need to do. And so we're going to pass them in as double dash parameters. Input, stratify, quants. So we're going to get some quantiles. Turns out I didn't need that up here because this quantile is, is, is fixed. So I didn't need to define it as, an, as a dependency, but it is an input. And then I'm going to write the output. And this just says, write the rule name as the output. Okay? So all of these are strings. These are just strings. Okay? Now it turns out they're paths. But that's at this point, they're just strings. And we're handing the strings into our R code. And the R code is going to look like this. So here's, I'm going to, this is what we just looked at. And this is the R code. Okay? I'm going to use a library called argparse. And then I define the same ones, input, stratify, quants, and output, parse args. And once I call parse args, I have a named list called arguments, which then I use for load. Load the input. Load quants. And there we go. And we just have a series of things we can do. Okay? And I'm not going to go through all the other stuff, but here we just load the YAML file. That just by using a named list in R, all of these inputs end up in the code. Now, why did I go through all this song and dance? Okay. Why didn't I just hard code load open quote dot dot forward slash input forward slash uh, co estimates all straight dot R data? Why didn't I do that? Well, because if me a year from now wants to know how make magic numbers got done, I don't want to have to dig through the code. I just want to look here. This tells me what all the file relationships are in one place. Here, instead of dealing with what the paths are, 
I'm actually talking about the logic. I'm now thinking about what is the logic of each of these pieces. What, it, what am I doing? Well, I'm loading the input. What am I doing? I'm loading the quants, the quantiles. Okay? That's the logic. I'm getting to the names and the logic rather than getting tied up in the, the, the actual path constants, these strings, these constant strings that are embedded here. We're separating the logic of what we're doing from the data required to, to drive that logic. And that's, that's useful at this kind of clarification level, but even more importantly, it means that every task in the entire project is executed by running make. You don't have to remember this incredibly complicated line. You just run make. You run make, the task runs, no matter what task you're in. If you want to execute a task, you never have to think about it. You just run make. You don't have to remember that, which you're not going to remember. So. Don't kid yourself. YAML is this constants, this really, really simple constants mapping. So here is this stratify.yaml, really, really simple little mapping. I have a number of years. I have a number of records. I have um, a number of, of, uh, of uh, monthly stratifications. I have records in the period. I have a number of, 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 of specialized stratifications, number of strata, and so forth. I have a series of numeric results. Uh, that probably, by the way, were generated by some other code upstream. And I, I don't think anybody hand coded that. I generated it upstream and then passed the YAML file down through symlinks to here so that I could use them for checking, probably. Or I could use them for calculation somewhere else. Or I could use them in the document, in the report, which I'm about to show you. So whenever you have to remember what a constant is, give it a name and map it out in a YAML file so that you can remember it. You don't have to generate YAML files by hand. Write the YAML files out with code. And then you can use them later on in your process. So instead of trying to pan one number down five steps through the task list, you write a YAML file and you just hand the symlink through. Now you have a name for it and a symlink that tells you where it came from. And all the documentation is in place naturally. So if you save a lot of intermediate files, you can test stuff. And that's another advantage of saving all these little pieces as when they get produced and then passing them downstream as necessary. So in particular, um, binary formats will tend to be problems for you later, especially proprietary binary formats that will change and you will have trouble reading later. And if you decide to become really, really, really clever and not at all smart and create your own homegrown binary format with like, if you've ever used Python pack or struct, you're fired. Um, because you will never be able to read that again. So DBF is this ancient, creaky, ancient format from like the early 80s. We still find DBF files getting written around. There are still a bunch of tools that's, that read and write DBF files because it's an incredibly simple binary data format. And it's simple and it's fast <coughs> and it's fixed length and you can search it in these really simple ways. Ugh. But there's a lot of other tool dependent um, binary formats that are really problematic. I warned you about this earlier. Uh, Pickle, RDS, RDA, RData, uh, HDF5, um, all really, really challenging. They work and sometimes you have to use them because otherwise you're just throwing away the metadata with each step, but it's really hard. But flat text files endure. Those are the things that you're going to be able, you can be sure you're going to be able to read a year from now. And that might be just simple delimited text. CSV, which should never be a CSV. If you're delimiting things, a comma is probably the single worst delimiter you can ever use uh, because commas occur all the time in normal text. So now you have to parse around the, where the real commas are and the delimiter, oh, Jesus, just use a pipe um, or a tab at worst. SQL dumps or even XML if you just feel like you have to flagellate yourself. I mean, if, uh, seriously, people who write XML, I think their backs are all scarred and they like sit quietly in rooms and whip themselves. I don't know, whatever. <coughs> oh. So, um, oh, <laughs> that was terrifying. Okay, uh, it may seem like a great idea to abstract your work into libraries that you use repeatedly, but here's the downside of that. Um, projects live longer than libraries, and libraries evolve faster than projects. So if you abstract all your work into a library, then the library keeps evolving, and then you come back two years later, your code won't run if it depends on that library. Oops. So there's a real challenge in the, in the balance between the correct instinct to separate your code out into functions that you call repeatedly and then making it persistent with the work that you're doing so that you have adequate documentation of what you did later. This is a real challenge. 
And uh, it, it's, it's a flavor of this larger problem that we have in software called API rot, where APIs aren't what you think they are when you go back to try to use them later. Um, and I'm, these, we're starting to get into too much of the weeds here, so I'm gonna keep moving so that we can get into the notion of um, how we actually produce a result. And here is an actual result. So this is a section from a report that I wrote for the UN. This section explains how to use the strata. So we consider as an example this stratum, um, blah, 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 and we have this stratum identifier. There are 290 reported homicides in this. Um, ha hang on, what, what if I, what's gonna happen if I change the deduplication? That number, 290, could change. This report is 150 pages long, and almost every page has this many references to the data on it. Here's one, um, here's one. Um, each one of these is a reference to the data. There's another one. Um, the, here are two more. This is part of one page. If I change the deduplication, every one of those numbers could potentially change. How am I gonna remember to update them all? Yeah, you're not, and now your report's wrong. So, uh, you know, and that's the gentle way of putting it, that you did it wrong, okay? So what do you do? The right answer is not, oh, just I can't, I can't update my data. No, I, I can't do it. I, everything would change because that's not real. That's not how the world works. The partners are going to change everything at the last second. And if you think they're not, <laughs> mimosas. Yeah, I, I think you, uh, yeah, no. You write your reports like this, okay? You write everything with variable embedding. So this is a language called Sweeve. Um, and it's Sweeve in LaTeX, but you can now do this with different flavors of Markdown have aspects of this as well. Um, I use LaTeX because, um, as I mentioned before, I'm really old. Uh, however, um, Markdown is still, is, is, is quickly replacing most of the things that we used to do in LaTeX. And you can embed variable references in Markdown as well. R has got it really going on. Uh, the Jupyter Notebook world is evolving very, very quickly in this direction, and that'll make it possible not only for R, but for uh, Julia and Python as well. Um, and so what we've got is something that looks like this. Each of these places where we have an S expression, which is a weird way of saying an R expression, uh -huh. and for those of you who know the weird and complicated political history of R, you know where that comes from. But we have a reference here to x underscore 0, 1, 1, 0, 0 that equals some reference to a data frame uh, and there must be only one row because I'm not making a row reference. Oh, right, here's where it is. We have a little tiny bit of embedded R code where we subset it a single row from a data frame that clearly we, much, we must have read in earlier, which we'll call DFL. And DFL, in this case, I'm grabbing a field from it, which is, oh, unsurprisingly, the field I'm referring to, oh, how useful it is to be able to confirm that I did it right, and then I close it off. And when I execute this, um, when I execute this with PDF LaTeX in order to generate the output, um, that in a pre-processing step is instantiated with the actual value that goes there, but the value that came from that data frame. I tie it all together, that data frame was generated as one of those magic numbers. The reason we call them, remember we did all that whole example with magic numbers in the make file? The reason we call them magic numbers is because once they appear, once they appear here, that's a magic number. How did it get there? What does that mean? What do you mean 290? How do you know that? Well, if you just typed it in, a year from now, you have no idea how to answer any of those questions. You have no idea. But if you did it like this, you now have an audit trail for every single number in your report. And the audit trail starts here, with the reference, takes you back to the code in magic numbers, which then takes you through sim links and code references all the way through your computation. You have an audit trail for every single claim you've made all the way down to the ground every single time, always. That's a requirement in our team. We do not issue reports unless we can do that. And the reason is not because we're somehow so magical, it's because I've fucked it up so many times and I will never, ever get it wrong again because that's such a bad feeling. That is such a very, very, very bad thing. You must not ever make those mistakes. And as projects get bigger and as they last longer, the probability of those mistakes goes right to one. It goes right to one. And so this kind of discipline is, what you, is how you can get out of it. There are probably other ways. This is the only one I found. And here we're tying together this idea, this kind of code. I didn't write Sweeve, right? It comes from the world of, um, from back in the 80s, Donald Knuth used to call it reproducible research. 
um, or reproducible programming. Now it's called reproducible research, and there's a whole community in the R world who's thinking a lot about this notion of reproducible research. The Python people through the Jupyter community are starting to think about it as well. <coughs> and it's all about embedding your argument, embedding your quantitative argument in the text of your human language argument. You're mixing these, thing to, these things together in this way so that your, the number that comes out is not somehow hard-coded in there magically, that it, like it fell from the sky and you probably typed it wrong anyway. So, um, Yeah, I don't even know if I believe this slide anymore. Um, <laughs> but look, the, I'm going to close now with be serious about data processing. Um, even with perfect data and an ideal model, programming errors can make the answers wrong. In fact, I would say, I'd say that much more strongly. It's almost certain that your answers are wrong. I mean, getting, uh, when you have hundreds of tasks that are required to get to an answer, how can you possibly not have made a mistake in hundreds of tasks? H how? Right? And all we can do is everything humanly possible to prevent that. <laughs> right? That's all we can do. But if we fail to do everything humanly possible to prevent that, we're pretty much just guaranteeing that our results are the product of some kind of programming error. All right? And honestly, I feel like we should just call Excel, you know, error generator, but Microsoft does not accept my branding requests. <laughs> <laughs> Raw data, in particular about violence, what I study, is almost never correlated with reality. So we have a lot of work to do before we can make an argument with that data. A lot of, lot of, lot of work to do. And we then need to make sure that all that data processing does not introduce even more error. Um, and I'll, yeah, whatever, that's not hugely relevant. But let's just say that in my world, it's really, really important to get the answer right. This is our most recent publication, which is about a month ago. Uh, in which we, with Amnesty, published the number of, an estimate of the number of people who have been killed in Syrian jails and prisons since uh, March 11th, uh, 2011, not 15th, <coughs> just saying. Um, and we calculated that using DGA, for those of you who, when we talked about that earlier, because LCMCR, we're not entirely all the way there yet, but um, it's a Bayesian estimate based on four data sets of um, Syrian uh, human rights NGOs, the Violations of Documentation of Syria, not, not for Human Rights, the Damascus Center for Human Rights, and the uh, Syrian Center for Statistics and Research, they have all done really terrific grassroots documentation of people who are dying in prison. And we uh, deduplicated all those data sets, we merged them, and then did a multiple systems estimate on that and gave it to Amnesty. Uh, the white paper is on our uh, website. You're welcome to dig in if you'd like to read the math. So that's my argument. Uh, we have about half an hour.